The format of this video will be an overview and discussion of German journalist Hans Zerre's worldview in quoting and referencing his book Man in This World, published in 1952, allowing one to ponder the profound thoughts with some added commentary from yours truly. Let us begin. Despair is like bolting oneself in an empty room and vehemently affirming the nothingness. The man accepts the void in which he is brooding and says, home, family, profession, property, it has all gone. Good, there is only nothingness. That's how life is, that and no other way. Only a fool ever believed anything else. But if life is really senseless, with only nothingness behind everything, then nothingness is the whole sense of life, and everything which doesn't pertain to nothingness is false and without meaning, not worth living. In that affirmation, evil is born in man. He has succumbed to the temptation of despair. Perhaps I am mistaken, but it seems Zera is hinting at a sense of defiance to the nihilism by effectively stating that an affirmation of nothingness is an affirmation of evil, and that succumbing to the temptation of despair is bad, just as succumbing to temptation in any case is bad from a religious moral sense. Surely Zero will present an alternative affirmation of brave stoicism, shouldering the burden, and an affirmation of meaningfulness as being an affirmation of good or righteousness. At its core, the argument appears to be that once a man loses everything, he is free, from a baptism of fire to a rebirth into total liberty. Yet total liberty is too much liberty, and thus potential evil, because of the loss of meaning and lack of duty. The religious, God-seeking man is also confronted by despair and nothingness, for in order to find God, he denies himself and in the cruelest self-discipline strips away everything that keeps him from God, home, family, profession and property. He receives into himself the powers of his being, which had been given to these things, eschews them, placing himself voluntarily in the void in which God's power can flow. It is the same void of despair, only the plus or minus quality with which men stare into it is different. The man of religion goes into nothingness with the positive expectation that God will reveal himself and that he will gain assurance. The other man goes into it without expectations and therefore experiences it only negatively and destructively. The one goes up, the other down. One advances beyond nothingness and suddenly recovers himself and is renewed. The other turns away from the nothingness but opposes himself to everything that has location and purpose. Daemonism, or demonism, of absolute evil begins. The frightful thing about this condition resulting from the vacant life of being unable to live and unwilling to die is its absolute boredom and the inability to attain self-forgetfulness except by the substitute of tension, sensation and destruction. This could relate to the prevalence of substance abuse, to fill the void, just to feel something, thus sensation and eventual destruction. Martin Luther wrote, It is God's nature to make something out of nothing. Therefore, God cannot make anything out of someone who is not yet nothing. Therefore, this logic dictates that if you are in the depths of nihilism and despair, you ought to admit guilt, admit fault, wipe your conscience clean, and consider turning to God for guidance if you want to elicit change and a sense of renewal. No wonder this pattern of being born again occurs so often in prisons or following significant trauma. The basis of Zara's first chapter asserts that basing one's life and thus existence solely on your home, family, profession and property is foolish because in times of absolute despair, for example, war and its aftermath, all those things can be taken from you 
in an instant. And thus, because you based your existence on those things alone, you immediately lose your raison d'etre, or reason for being, in an instant, and fall into even deeper despair. Zera argues something constant and metaphysical, in this case religious faith, is thereby essential to survive in a chaotic, ever-changing world. He says, the immediate relationship with authority begins to weaken the moment the rich man no longer strives to make something better of himself and the world around him, a purpose requiring a consciousness of his own imperfection, based upon the recognition of something above him to which he is subordinate and towards which he must strive. When men no longer look upward, they sink into boredom, and from the dull emptiness of existence, the urge to self-annihilation, the dark desire for death, arises. The premise of adopting a lifestyle, rather than seeking and attaining a greater level of true enlightenment, is flawed. It is shallow, and hence rather fake. In fact, all lifestyles are shallow and fake. The whole idea of living a specific lifestyle allows you to be entirely subjective, and gives you an apparent excuse to only care about the realm within which you inhabit. The individual thus has the choice to live their own lifestyle and escape criticism. As Protagoras said, man is the measure of all things. Therefore, without a sense of higher power against which to measure things, liberalism at its modern day logical conclusion has become the incredibly arrogant notion of I am the measure of all things, and no one else nor any set of objective standards can tell me otherwise. Man has effectively become his own God. Man has become the measure of all things because God is no longer universally the measure of all things. Much to the chagrin of Friedrich Nietzsche, who despite being atheistic, still effectively mourned the death of God at the hands of excessive rationalism which led to the rejection of the metaphysical. God is dead and we have killed him, thereby underlying the historical significance of the science versus religion debate. When you open yourself up to total skepticism, you risk declining spiritually and thus declining culturally because you no longer care for your roots or for the preservation of the fabric of who you once were. There is a correlation between wishing to maintain civilization and the subsequent uphold of civilization, and a causation between tearing civilization down and a subsequent regression to barbaric behavior. You can't argue to tear civilization down from one angle, but uphold it from another. It is something that will collapse if it is not supported from every angle. The attack on the family, shattering the authority of husband and father, leads to the emancipation of women and the revolt of modern youth. Both are phenomena it has been possible to observe over a number of decades. They have led to an extraordinary repression of masculine authority within the family and to a partial reversal of the hierarchy established for many generations. Man's cognitive powers do not afford him the knowledge of the meaning of his existence, but only allow him to perceive that he is an unfinished being who can but hope to acquire perfection in the course of his development. This leads him to surrender the proposition that he is himself forsooth the measure of all things, and inclines him to modesty and humility. But modesty and humility are bridges which logically and immutably lead one over into the sphere of the religious. Man begins once more to realize that his self-satisfaction, his absoluteness, and his autonomy stand on weak foundations, and his existence cannot be based upon them. He suspects that he is subordinated to a higher power, and slowly acquires once more an understanding of his dependence. Revolution and religion are very close together and modern man is torn between them. He has overthrown what remains of authority, only to be confronted by questions which bring him back to religion. He is passing through a historic transition 
so vast that it can be compared only with that undergone in the first centuries of our epoch, or the transition between the Middle Ages and modern times, the division between revolution and religion in a transition age runs through each individual, and he cannot escape his heroic destiny. Hence, man today is a split personality. The battle is being waged in him, just as it is in the world around. Basically, this is the internal and external struggle of order and chaos, or right and left, and the likelihood of, once modest and with the benefit of wisdom, returning to religion and renouncing yourself as the measure of all things, perhaps akin to the Spenglerian second religiousness. Another important concept to consider is when Zera refers to consciousness, as in mind and intellect, instrument, as in body, and culture, as in soul or spirit. Consciousness corresponds to the inner world, the instrument to the body, and the culture to the natural world outside. Man is thus conditioned by the fact that with one part of his being, he has fallen out of creation's security, and must himself create the shell in which he can live and develop. As a fallen being, he is less than other living creatures, since he is unfinished and imperfect, while they are complete within the bounds of their own world. As a creative being, however, he is more than the created things around him, for with the phenomenal shapes of consciousness, of the instrument, and of culture, he introduces something new into the work of natural creation, a something beyond which makes him an obsessive being, that is to say, the lord of creation. Whence does he draw the power to maintain a contest with the world and free himself from anguish? Manifestly, the something more is within. In direct opposition to plants and animals, he has retained free, unfettered, shape-giving powers which are oriented to the goal of his ultimate perfection. He is the one being who remains in a state of becoming and transformation and is only to be understood as something in the course of development towards an end. It is this not yet realized quality in him which constitutes the something beyond, which distinguishes him from the rest of creation. And it is from this still unmortgaged in a surplus that the power of coming to terms with the world grows up. Culture and consciousness are unstable qualities, neither existent by their own strength nor borne up by the will of creation. They depend on man's power to bear them and nourish them, and they collapse the moment that his power begins to relax. If man makes the whole of his existence dependent upon the pseudo-reality of culture, he is drawing his strength from the works which he himself has created, and which demand of him the power for their maintenance. Thus, we get the vicious circle that what demands man's strength in order to be maintained has first to give him the strength to carry out the task. Once man has gotten into the vicious circle, the decline of culture and consciousness begins. The decline will not be apparent while man can still draw liberally from the reservoir of strength the preceding generations have stored up. But the collapse is swift and catastrophic when the reserves become low. Essentially, Zera argues here that to properly engage with culture, one must become cultured and take up the mantle of being the new culture-bearing stratum of the next generation. The culture-bearing stratum must produce highly cultured and competent works of their own volition and pass them on to others, especially if the culture itself is to survive, re-emerge or prosper in the future even if just for one last hurrah of triumph, like a defiantly stoic geriatric standing among the ruins of a once greatly fortified castle of virtue. Without question, there is a hierarchy on the human plane, and equality among men exists only in the eyes of God. If man loses 
his godly counterpart. It matters little whether he stands for equality or inequality, since in either case he will end in the worst of despotism. The hierarchical elements which consciousness is beginning to rediscover serve to lay the foundation of Caesarism. Zera is arguing that in accordance with the basic doctrine of Christianity, all men have dignity because they are made in the image of God. But then in a world without God, it is irrelevant whether you believe in equality or inequality, because to achieve either ideal on a large scale, you would have to become a dictator and crush your opposition. Since modern man is the measure of all things, he would never willfully agree to living in a world that he didn't like. Therefore, as a dichotomy, if man has dignity with God, then logically speaking, without God, man has no dignity, and the will of the philosopher king, or pharaoh dictatorial type figure of Plato's Republic, is what solely dominates. Parallels can be drawn with modern day technocrats. The serf has no value to his master unless he complies and believes what he is told to believe. And even then, he is obviously still subject to the will of the dictator. Either a totally equal world or totally unequal world would have to be and would be ruthlessly maintained by those in charge if either ideal were ever to be actualized. So you would end up with the same tyrannical outcome just for opposing ideals. Naturally, the tyrant engages in Kantian radical evil by believing they are doing good in pursuing the ideal, yet in doing so, they are simultaneously debasing the dignity of man in the process, and thus, the process inevitably ends in disaster. Total inequality is not dignified, neither is total equality. Inequality is natural, but impossible to keep civil. Therefore, there obviously must be some objective structure that is commonly agreed upon and accepted. Structure that is not natural, but may serve to equalize and dignify things to a balanced extent in an otherwise unequal and undignified harsh reality. The structure is community. Thus, community plus Christianity equals dignity for man. As per Zera, the whole idea of progress and development and secular humanist utopia comes from religious beliefs, comes from Kiliasm or millennialism, the idea of creating a thousand years of peace, Reich or realm. Kiliasm is the powerful and yet dangerous idea of creating a heavenly kingdom on earth. It is also the belief in the thousand years of peace that is supposed to come before the final judgment or end times known as eschatology. It is not necessarily natural or innate for man to be progressive or utopian like liberalism and socialism would have you believe. In fact, the very idea that the liberal bases their entire ideology on is quite clearly a religious one. So religion still impacts upon the liberal, perhaps more than they realize. They cannot remove themselves from their own cultural soul. Kiliasm relates closely to the Faustian spirit. It is the devil's bargain itself, in some sense. The presumption that we can create our own heaven on earth. Progress is the attempt to do just that. Many proponents have specifically referred to Christian socialism or socialistic ideals as having a redemptive quality, most probably in that religious context pertaining to man seeking redemption because of the fall of man and original sin stemming from Adam and Eve's rebellion in the Garden of Eden. Some even refer to Jesus as the first social democrat. It is interesting, however, then, that Karl Marx had a largely dismissive view of religion, referring to it as the opium of the people. Marx thereby 
seemingly accepted a certain aspect of religion's practical value for society in providing comfort, reducing immediate suffering, and giving strength and perspective to the needy. But Marx also considered religion to be harmful, as in his view it prevented acknowledgement of class structure and oppression. Thus it became an obstacle to any necessary revolution. Both socialism and Marxism are primarily concerned with advocating for changes or developments that are strictly of this earthly world, the world of man, or the world of Satan. Whilst religion, and particularly Christianity, is concerned with living in the world above this world and focused on the kingdom of God and the premise of an afterlife, not in the kingdom of the world of man or Satan, with no spiritual realm. Therefore, it begs the question, how can Christianity and socialism combine to form a coherent worldview if both ideologies are primarily focused on opposite worlds? For some further historical context, certain aspects of the Kiliasm idea sound eerily similar to that which motivated the Khmer Rouge to commit horrible atrocities in Cambodia, starting again from year zero and attempting to create their own heaven on earth. Progress does not always make things better. This idea is also closely aligned with political theology. Thus, it is possible to argue that anyone who chooses to be political is religious in a sense, either believing in traditional religiosity or political religiosity. Ergo, you can't be political and not be religious. Even if you say you're not, you are. Because when you argue for a belief, a belief is a form of faith. The intellect was always so much greater the less power it had, and force the stronger the less intelligence it had. Such is the law which dominates the tension between intellect and force. Hence, the more intellectual someone is, the more enlightened, conscious and intelligent they are likely to say they are, as cover for a real lack of force and thus a lack of traditional power, possibly because they become so obsessed with intellect that they disregard physicality. In the metaphysics of the progressive ideology, if there is such a thing. There is no concept of evil, only a concept of ignorance, which replaces evil and hence must be eradicated. You are a friend and are intelligent because you agree with the credentialed, the academic authority or the expert. Your enemies are backward and ignorant because they do not agree. No actual evidence or factual argument ever enters the scenario. This is why the liberal and progressive will always encourage in a condescending manner that you should quote, educate yourself, yet coincidentally be quite uneducated themselves because they have never truly questioned something they previously learned, unless they were told to question it by those from which they learned the information in the first place and who are actually looking to deconstruct and remodel the education itself, out with old lessons of a traditional, classic, or genuine liberal education, and in with the new ravenous desire to constantly critique. Even when something has been critiqued many times before, it shall be mercilessly critiqued and self-destructive forevermore, in the effort to be more woke, until eventually nothing remains. The elite naturally desire to have their perceptions transformed into reality. If they find an opportunity for this by themselves attaining power, something inhumane and demonic will occur. For now, morbid, fanatical human consciousness is ruling, which can escape from personal responsibility in the assumption that events take place according to laws of their own. For example, how contradictory is it that economists would argue the economy has fallen due to the natural 
ebbs and flows of the market and not manipulation, but then simultaneously argue that if it wasn't manipulated, it would fall, it would cause a depression, but only because they have manipulated it in the first place. And yet the powers that be surely wouldn't want to admit how much they've manipulated it. And if they ever do admit it, it is because they know they can get away with it. The market, when left to its own devices, is chaos, and thus fair in deciding who wins and loses. The elite need to use politics to make sure they stay on top. The problem with economics is that it is entirely an abstraction, as reality is political economy. They conveniently ignore the reality that is tied to politics. So either politics can set who the winners and losers are, or the market, aka chaos, can, when truly it is happening all at once. Elites wish to maintain control of their power and don't want to risk losing it. So there is therefore no doubt that political candidates are often handpicked for special interests. The man who possesses power today takes what measures seem to him to be necessary, coldly and unmoved, because he regards them as an essential part of destiny. The responsibility linking him with events has been ruptured. He feels himself to be but the instrument of higher laws into which his consciousness has gained insight. Any appeal to his humanity would be impassively rejected since he believes in the absolute necessity of the measures he has enacted. He belongs to a small esoteric group which no longer debates nor seeks the truth but believes itself to already be in possession of it. He is the representative of the human cerebrum which has swollen up and grown independent somewhat like a cancer Possessed of power, he gives practical effect to the formula of God equals human consciousness. His fellow man who rejects his authority becomes an opponent and therefore must be overcome. This is an obvious reference to the God complex that many of the powerful figures of the world have, as well as the friend-enemy dialectic. It is one of the peculiarities of power that it hungers for voluntary and spontaneous confirmation, which it is unable to secure. A hopeless sense of loneliness arouses hatred of those who cannot or will not confirm the tyrant's subjective truth, and therefore refuse to provide him with the metaphysical basis of existence. In this hatred, consciousness attains the extreme point of its reserve and is driven to approve of the crisis for punishing and destroying its opponents. It retains its likeness to God, the being who rules and punishes. This is rather obvious reference to Kantian radical evil yet again. Modern man regards the crisis as a judgment or punishment, but whereas his forebears traced it to their own guilt and accepted it as their punishment, punishment from God, Modern man looks upon it as the guilt and punishment of the other man. The crisis has occurred only because the other man is what he is, i.e. because he has not apprehended or not obeyed my own subjective truth as the truth. Herein lies the fallacy of universal morality forcing someone to agree with your concept of morality as the only possible concept. Hence the other is wrong because the other is evil. Of course it has nothing to do with how I may have treated them in trying to convince them to adopt my worldview. As a final security, consciousness sails with the storm of the crisis and approves the event as judging and punishing the other man. Thus, man can shield himself from the crisis and exclude any possibility of personal change. Such behavior must intensify the crisis, driving it to the limit of annihilation. Our crisis today 
is the crisis of the Promethean science as a religion of reason. Virtually everything has become relative. Infinite numbers of people have no longer any absolute system of values, whether in this world or a world beyond. That must mean the end of culture, the decline of the West, unless we find a new system of values or a given one. Absolute truth is denied and believed to be non-existent. However, by claiming that there is no universal truth, one is making a universal claim, using universalism to denounce universalism, which is a contradiction and self-refutation. There needs to be something identified as true for arguments to even exist, something that is obviously considered worthwhile arguing over, something you believe in and don't believe in. To use the postmodern nihilistic critique that I believe in nothing is still to be making a conscious argument. In Western philosophy, nothing is still something. What is then considered true in an objective sense, i.e. what is commonly agreed upon, is either subjectively supported or rejected by the individual as what ought to be or what ought not to be. The aforementioned form of argument is called a transcendental argument, as in to say some sense of agreed truth must exist for it to even be possible to argue over. Otherwise, why ever argue anything? What is the point of doing anything or believing in anything if it has no inherent meaning and is just a series of chemical reactions in one's brain and apparently nothing more? Where does the chemical reaction end and the individual's consciousness of themselves begin? At what point does the individual believe they make their own arguments or have their own thoughts or ownership over their own mind if such things are just apparently solely chemical processes? These are interesting and profound questions indeed.